Hey all, it's me, Two Sheds. And before we start this video, I have a question for you. Who do you think is the worst president that America has ever had? Are you thinking of him? Or maybe him? How about him? Okay, he's not too far off. But allow me to show you someone who I think is a much worthier answer. Over the course of however long this video ends up being, I have no clue, honestly. Let's talk about the one, the only, Thomas Woodrow Wilson. Now, some of you might be thinking, Two Sheds, isn't he considered to be one of the better presidents? Well, she's wrong. Well, if you're thinking that, allow me to be the dog pack 404 of president people. While yes, some other great historians here on YouTube have made amazing videos on our guy, I want to go all out and make the most comprehensive video on that I can. So join me on this journey as I tell you the story of Woodrow Wilson. So Woodrow Wilson was born on December 28, 1856, in Staunton, Virginia, to parents Joseph Ruggles and Jesse Janet Wilson. Wilson's father worked as a pastor and had recently been assigned to Staunton shortly before Wilson was born, who was actually born in the church his father worked at. No, I'm not kidding. His mother met him while studying in college in Steubenville, Ohio. Early in his life, he and his family moved to Augusta, Georgia, where they became Confederate citizens during the Civil War, his parents even being big supporters of the Southern cause, which explains a lot. His father even founded the first and only ever Presbyterian church in the Confederate States. It's even said that Wilson's first memory was being told that Abraham Lincoln had been elected president and that war was inevitable. Yeah, it's making more and more sense. After the war, he and his family moved to Columbia, South Carolina, where his father made a career change from pastor to theology professor, which is likely where Wilson's lifelong interest in education began. He started college himself during the 1873 to 1874 school year at Davidson College in North Carolina before quickly moving to the College of New Jersey, the school now known as Princeton University. Let me tell you, he had quite a future there. So let's get into the start of that. While he was a student there, he studied political philosophy and history, which were two of his biggest interests. Why does he have to have the same ones as me? He took an active role in politics for the first time in his life when he supported the unsuccessful presidential candidate Samuel J. Tilden during the election of 1876. He graduated Princeton in 1879 and then moved on to law school at the University of Virginia. That didn't last long though, since even at a younger age, he suffered from chronically poor health, which would haunt him for years to come. He ended up losing interest in law after a bit anyway, and when his health problems cleared up for a moment in 1883, he went to get his PhD in history and government from John Hopkins University. But around that time, he ended up meeting a very special someone. So early into his journey to get a PhD, our man Woody met a woman called Ellen Axon. They ended up falling in love quickly, and they were engaged a mere five months after meeting. Though they put off the wedding for a bit while he worked on his PhD, and she tended to her ailing father and attended art school at the Art Students League of New York. The two were finally married on June 24th, 1885. They ended up having three daughters together, Margaret, Jessie, and Eleanor. Not long after their marriage, they both finished their education, with Ellen finishing up art school and Woodrow Wilson finally 
getting his PhD in history in 1886. He then made the leap from student to full-time teacher. So Wilson started teaching during the 1885 to 1886 school year at Bryn Mawr College in Pennsylvania, a women's college which he was a founding professor at. During his few years there, he taught Greek history, Roman history, and American history alongside political science, as per usual from him. However, like a certain someone else I can think of, Wilson was not a fan of the dean of the school, Carrie Thomas, who gave him what he believed was an unfair contract. He ended up quitting in 1888 in favor of a teaching gig at Wesleyan University in Middleton, Connecticut. Over there, he taught political economics and Western European history, sort of like what I was doing in my previous big video. He also coached the football team there and even founded the school's debate team. Despite his achievements, he wasn't there long either because his colleagues landed him an even better gig as the chair of jurisprudence and political economy back at his alma mater, the College of New Jersey. In 1896, while there, he, among others, got the name changed to its current name, Princeton University. Speaking of 1896, that was the year he started to spread his own influence on the politics of the day. Notably, during the presidential election that year, despite being a lifelong Democrat, he refused to support Kansas Representative William Jennings Bryan, their party's nominee that year, for no reason other than the two disagreed politically. Wow, how times really haven't changed. Also, kind of ironic considering the role he'd go on to play Wilson later on, but let's get back on track. Instead... He endorsed the more conservative John Palmer, the then governor of my home state of Illinois. Somehow I feel personally insulted by the fact that he wanted anything to do with this state. But anyway, he, when he wasn't sticking his dirty hands in the political circuit, he was sticking it to the keyboard, though probably a different one than the one I used to write this video, as I can imagine. Like many a college professor, he wrote all kinds of books, mostly about government and history. His most famous was likely Division and Reunion, which is where he really started to catch on as a serious historian. After building up enough steam, he got quite the unforeseen promotion. So in 1902, Woodrow Wilson's friend, Francis Patton, the president of Princeton during his time teaching there, decided to retire and named Wilson as his successor, which he jumped at the chance for. In his new position, he got the school a record amount of funding by convincing wealthy people such as Moses Pine and even Andrew Carnegie to give them their money. I want your money, I'm strapped for cash. I need your money to raise it to get a job. Give me your money, I'm not being funny. Give me your money today! Though it probably couldn't have required too much convincing, seeing as how both of them went there in the first place. Unfortunately, this was where his racist southerner side started to show as while at the time, more and more top-tier schools like Princeton were accepting black people as students, Wilson did everything in his newfound power to keep them away. Nevertheless, Wilson's acclaim in the public eye steadily continued to rise. However, his time as the school's president wasn't all sunshine and roses. In 1906, he suffered a terrible blood clot which left him blind in one eye for the rest of his life. He then went to Bermuda to recuperate, where it was rumored by his contemporaries that he may have had an affair, though in retrospect that's not all that likely. By 1909, though, he was tired of his job and was more and more interested in entering the political circuit himself. During the previous year's DNC, he spoke about others to being on the presidential ticket, 
though it once again went to the aforementioned William Jennings Bryan for the third time. But there was a different position that seemed to want him. So, like I said before, Woodrow Wilson was a lifelong Democrat, but New Jersey, his home state, was pretty heavily Republican-leaning. It voted pretty heavily for Republican President William Taft in the previous presidential election, and a Democrat hadn't been elected its governor since 1892, a year that was not in my human lifespan, but definitely was in Woodrow Wilson's. But anyhow, the Democratic base was getting pretty desperate for a possible shift in power and were willing to take a chance with the unconventional Wilson. His main opponent was the majority leader of the General Assembly, Vivian Lewis. At first, his chances seemed pretty small. But in the final days of the campaign, Wilson found his audience and won it over with a variety of speeches where he claimed to be a progressive which was a popular position to take at the time. When election day came on November 8, 1910, Wilson won decisively, receiving 53.9% of the state's vote against Lewis's 42.6%. He was even able to turn the state's assembly to democratic control. After being inaugurated as governor on January 17, 1911, he did little besides pass his pseudo-progressive bills relating to social services such as medicine and railroads. Unfortunately, that became more and more difficult after the Republicans retook the state assembly in the 1912 state midterm but he had bigger things on his mind. So after his unexpected governorship win in 1910, Woodrow Wilson became a pretty respected figure in the Democratic Party. His claims of being a progressive and his Southern background earned him support from both wings of the party. Still though, the presidency seemed like a long shot as most Democrats wanted it to go to House Speaker Champ Clark. However, Wilson had one thing that Clark didn't have, Southern support. As it turns out, all he needed was just a little support from the North. He received that by promising the vice presidency to Indiana Governor Thomas Marshall. At the 1912 DNC, after a whopping 46 ballots, Wilson received the nomination. Now, since progressivism was catching on in the early 20th century, the Democrats, who had often opposed many of the practices, struggled to keep up with the Republicans in the polls. No Democrat had been elected since Grover Cleveland all the way back in 1892. But Wilson set out to change that. And by that, I mean watch the Republican Party fall apart. You see, at the end of his second term, President Theodore Roosevelt decided not to campaign for re-election, like most presidents up to that point. Instead, he decided to give his Secretary of War, William Taft, his position in the 1908 election. But things didn't really exactly work out for him since Roosevelt was unhappy with some of Taft's decision as president. So... He decided to run for president again, but lost the Republican nomination to Taft. He didn't stop there, though. He founded his own third party, known as the Progressive Party, and ran as its first ever candidate for president. Unfortunately, what Roosevelt didn't see coming is that split the Republican vote, and because the Electoral College gives all of each state's votes to whoever gets the most votes, Wilson was unimpeded by any other candidate, unless you count this guy, but that wasn't enough. Come election day, November 5th, 1912, Wilson was easily elected. He received a whopping 435 electoral votes, even winning states that hadn't voted for a Democrat for president in decades. 
It seems like a landslide win for him, and it kind of was. But in actuality, he received only 41.8% of the popular vote, which is the worst performance in the popular vote from a winning candidate since before the Civil War. Former President Roosevelt came in a distant second, winning 88 electoral votes and 27.4% of the popular vote, which obviously wasn't enough to win, but was the best third-party performance since George Washington. And to date, the last time a third party came in second, incumbent William Taft ended up coming in an embarrassing third with a mere eight electoral votes and 23.2% of the popular vote, which was the worst performance in a presidential election ever from an incumbent candidate and the worst performance from a major party candidate up to that point. I guess it's true what they say about third parties being bad news for incumbents. And then Eugene Debs got most of the remaining 6% of the popular vote. You know, if I had a nickel for every time Wilson broke a Republican winning streak that started in 1892, I'd have two nickels. Which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it happened twice. But anyway, what's our new president to be to do? So Woodrow Wilson was inaugurated as our 28th president on March 4th, 1913. Now, I want y'all at home to do something real quick. I want you to open up your calendar app on your phone and mark that as the day it all went wrong. So Wilson's first move as president, like most presidents, was to set up a cabinet. Now, obviously, I don't have time to tell you about everybody who served under him. But here are some highlights. For Secretary of State, the highest person in the cabinet besides Wilson himself and Vice President Marshall, he went with the man he had personally opposed early in their own life, three-time failed presidential candidate William Jennings Bryan. After picking him, he got tired of doing that kind of work for himself and just had Bryan list off some people he do such as William McAdoo, who he made Secretary of the Treasury, and shortly after, he became Wilson's son-in-law while serving with him. Another highlight is possibly the only person in the cabinet who was as racist as Wilson himself, the infamous white supremacist James McReynolds. At first, he appointed him briefly as his attorney general, but moved him to the Supreme Court at his first opportunity, where he promptly went on to be probably the worst justice the court has ever had. Seriously, I think this guy could get his own video about how terrible he was. And maybe I will do that one day. But this video is about Tommy, not Jimmy. So congrats, you've escaped the full extent of my wrath. For now. Speaking of white supremacists, he put yet another one, Josephus Daniels as Secretary of the Navy. Now, he wasn't super notable in and of himself, other than who he chose as the Assistant Secretary of the Navy, none other than future President Franklin Roosevelt, who, wouldn't you know it, went on to have his own controversial legacy of racism. Is being racist the only ways to get into this man's cabinet? That makes sense, considering his views. So let's talk about those. So, I've said this a couple times in this video now, but Woodrow Wilson was pretty racist. Now, you might be thinking, but Two Sheds, wasn't everyone in the 1910s racist? Yeah, maybe I should rephrase that. Woodrow Wilson was exceptionally racist, even for his time. He grew up in the South during Reconstruction, and in fact was one of only two Confederate citizens to serve as president. His racism showed the most in 1915, when he made The Birth of a Nation, the first film ever to be played at the White House. The film, while known for the many advancements it made for the technical aspects of the medium, is also quite possibly 
the most racist movie ever made. So I'm assuming most of you know about the Ku Klux Klan. You know, those people who dress in white and are really racist. I'm not even kidding. This movie makes them the good guys. If you hadn't guessed already, the number one fan of this movie in the whole world was the one, the only, Thomas Woodrow. It's like writing history with lightning, Wilson. How much did he enjoy it? I'm not joking. He got the director to put in a quote from one of his books in the movie. Now, I'm pretty sure this movie has been in the public domain for a long time now, so I think I can show you the full clip. So yeah, he liked the movie a lot. And worse, with his endorsement, combined with the general popularity of the film at the time, after being dormant since Reconstruction, the Ku Klux Klan caught a second win, which, as of the making of this video, continues. As a result, race-related violence skyrocketed during his administration, and he didn't do a thing to intervene. And that's another thing. His racist tendencies were so great that they actively had a role in his policy making. You know how I said that being racist was pretty much the only way to get into his cabinet? Well, together they helped pass more and more Jim Crow laws than ever. By the time he was president, black workers were starting to be able to get jobs in the government. Wilson had pretty much all of them fired. And even the few that remained worked in much more racist environments than ever before. How many bad place points do you think he was trying to get, honestly? Now, I've been going at him pretty hard here, but truth be told, his views on race aren't the main reason why I think he was the worst president ever. The damage he did with his actual powers as president was as bad, if not worse. So, let's start with those, starting with what I would consider to be the least of his evils. So in 1913, Woodrow Wilson became the first president to deliver the State of the Union Address to Congress in person since 1800. Between those years, it was given to them as a letter, but not so much anymore. This speech was more or less a preview to all the damage, I mean things, Wilson wanted to do for the country. Though... Most of the early stuff that got done were things that started under the Taft administration anyway, and Wilson couldn't be bothered to stop, such as the Revenue Act he often gets credit for. If you look deeper, you realize that this probably would happen whether he was president or not. Even he realized that, since he went right on to make the Federal Reserve. Now, I won't go on too long about this, but something funny he did alongside this was making the first ever $100,000 bill and putting his own face on it. What kind of ego does that take, really? And that was in 1910s money. With inflation, that's even more value he's trying to assign himself. So yeah, now's as good a time as any to say Wilson had what would now be called a messiah complex. He believed that he... And only he knew what was best for everyone. And he would fire anyone who even slightly disagreed with him. For instance, Secretary of State Bryan faced that in 1915. So what were his ideas he tried to force on everyone? He tried his best at first to address the antitrust policies of the early 20th century that were quite popular at the time. 
try his best to stay hip with the time. So how'd he do it? By reverting to the policies of decades prior that didn't work, hence the policies that succeeded him. Am I so out of touch? No. It's the 20th century. We're wrong. It was also the children who were wrong, as he also seemed pretty cool with child labor. He tried to hide that fact while running for re-election, so he acted like he opposed it, even signing anti-child labor laws into law, knowing full well his packed Supreme Court would strike it down. He also did more to break the isolationist stance of the country than even the last few presidents before him. At first peacefully, like when he purchased the Danish West Indies, but he later broke that peace in a pretty dramatic way. So, going into his presidency, Woodrow Wilson said, that he was going to move away from the imperialist stance of the previous few administrations. But like many of the other issues of the time, he flip-flopped after becoming president. You see, his racist ways made him think that the people down in Central America and the Caribbean were incapable of running a proper democracy, never mind that they have been doing so for decades. So he invaded some countries such as the Dominican Republic and Nicaragua in a way I can only imagine was similar to Chaz from The New Norm. He also was particularly harsh on Mexican dictator Porfirio Diaz, even though he was all things considered a minor threat and almost irrelevant to the common American. But arguably his biggest failure of his whole presidency Yes, worse than everything I've said so far was his response to World War I. So, in oversimplified terms, in June of 1914, Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria-Hungary was assassinated, so Austria-Hungary pulled Germany and the Ottoman Empire to fight the alliance they believed was responsible. After that, all of Europe basically started tearing itself apart in the most brutal war humanity had ever seen. Up to that point, anyway. Wilson certainly seemed to favor the Allied powers, but decided he was going to stay out of the war. Like, really stay out of the war. Read my lips. I won't go to war, ever, no matter what. Besides, he's got a more personal tragedy to worry about. So, unfortunately for the rest of the family, First Lady Ellen Wilson came down with Bright's disease, a deadly illness which, at the time, had no cure. So Wilson had her body frozen, looked for a cure, but fell into a vat of freezing liquid and became Mr. Freeze. Not nah, just kidding, but he's totally super villain enough for that, right? No, Ellen died and Wilson was left widowed. Naturally, Wilson took a big hit in his personal life here, even going so far as to tell an aide he'd rather be assassinated than go through this. If only our country were that lucky. But it wasn't all bad for him during this time. Like I mentioned, he got to see his favorite movie, and he fell in love again after meeting fellow widow, and probably more importantly to him, fellow southerner Edith Galt. He asked her to marry him almost immediately, but she said no. But Wilson kept at it. You see, back then... This was what we called charming, but now it's what we call creepy. Eventually, she relented, and they married on December 18, 1815. As a result, she immediately became the first lady, but that wouldn't last too long if her husband Tommy couldn't keep the office. So both Wilson and Vice President Marshall were easily renominated at the 1916 DNC, but just about everyone knew it was going to be a closer race than last time. For starters, there was no major third-party candidate to split his opponent's votes. And on top of that, the Republicans also nominated popular Supreme Court Justice Charles Hughes as their candidate. While Wilson tried his best to appeal to the progressive voters by trying to readopt some of the legislation. His main strategy was to point out how he totally, definitely, absolutely didn't want to join World War I, since public sentiment at that point mostly favored staying out. 
and many Republican politicians of the time actually favored entering. He kept us out of war was the name of the game this time around. The people of America cast their votes on November 7th, 1916. Unlike the landslide that was the election of 1912, this one was extremely close, with California, the deciding state, taking a few days to decide the winner. But at the end of the day, Woodrow Wilson just barely won, receiving 277 electoral votes and 49.2% of the popular vote, which was actually a much better showing here or there than in the previous election. Yeah, the Electoral College is and always has been terrible, but let's get back on track. Charles Hughes just trailed behind him, receiving 254 electoral votes and 46.1% of the popular vote, which was also a better showing than Wilson in 1912, hilariously enough. Wilson became the first president from the Democratic Party to win two consecutive terms since Andrew Jackson. And if you'd believe it, Thomas Marshall became the first vice president to get reelected since John Calhoun. Here's another son you might want to know. Supposedly, Wilson's plan, if he lost, was to appoint Hughes as Secretary of State, who at the time was the second in line in the line of succession to the presidency after the vice president and having both him and Thomas Marshall resign so Hughes could be president early. That would have been nice of him, but he didn't end up doing that because he won. But anyway, how did he do with the whole he kept us out of war thing? Today's adventure is... Getting into a pointless war that we have no place in. That's right, my fellow Americans, we're going to Germany. So, in May of 1915, German submarines sunk the ocean liner, the RMS Lusitania, killing 128 American citizens. Wilson was generally not happy about this, but he tried his best to stay the course. However, in January of 1917, Germany began practicing unrestricted submarine warfare, and so Wilson decided to look for an excuse to break the one thing that got him reelected. Oh, there it is. The Zimmerman Telegram. On April 2nd, 1917, just weeks into his second term, Wilson made arguably his most important speech to Congress, advocating for American entry into World War I. Four days later, they overwhelmingly declared war on Germany and later Austria-Hungary too. Because his ego was that inflated at this point, Wilson decided to tell everyone what to do once the war ended, believing that he, and only he alone, knew what was best for all of these countries. He thusly created the infamous 14 points, which he planned to include in the treaty after the war. In the midst of all this, Wilson committed the most egregious crime of his entire career yet. He signed into law the Espionage Act and the Sedition Act which literally made it illegal to criticize the U.S. military in any way. Yes, people, mostly Wilson's political opponents, went to jail for this. By the way, the Espionage Act is actually still in effect as of the making of this video, so, uh, go U.S. military! Woohoo! Wilson's new attorney general, Mitchell Palmer, was having a field day with all sorts of enemies arrested as well, leading to what we now know as the first Red Scare. On top of that, he and his son-in-law authorized low-interest war bonds, which caused inflation to skyrocket for the rest of the war. However, on November 11th, 1918, Kaiser Wilhelm II of Germany surrendered giving the Allies a victory. These last couple of years in office would be very important for the world. So let's see how he screws them up. Yeah, Wilson's foreign policy, to the surprise of no one, continued to be terrible even after the war. 
He went to Paris to attend the peace conference, which made him the first president to ever visit Europe while in office. Being the savior he thought he was, he made sure he was the only American who had any say with what went on. Greetings, mortals. I will make this quick. I... Woodrow Wilson, the greatest president America has ever had. Hereby demand complete and total supplication of this peace conference. To my command, submit and receive mercy. Resist and only defeat. The whole time he was there, he worked tirelessly to leave Germany in shambles, not even allowing them to have a diplomat to uh, speak up for themselves. That won't have any unforeseen consequences, will it? He was actually one of the big four, the most influential people there, alongside David Lloyd George of the UK, George Clemenceau of France, and Vittorio Orlando of Italy. In addition to screwing over Germany, Wilson pushed for a new League of Nations to try to prevent a war like this from ever happening again. Let's see how that goes. For pretty much just showing up and ruining Germany's future without giving them a say, I kid you not, Woodrow Wilson was awarded a Nobel Peace Prize. You can't keep getting away with it! Yeah, little known fact, when Jesse said that, he wasn't talking about Walt. He had Woodrow Wilson on the mind. So after finally getting the Treaty of Paris finalized, Wilson toured around the rest of Europe for a bit, then returned to America which is now in a recession as a result of the war. Race riots were killing people every day, and the Red Scare and Palmer raids were getting innocent people thrown in jail, and women were still not able to vote. Wilson was happy with all of that. All he wanted was for the United States to ratify the League of Nations. And then, on November 19th, 1919, he went to Congress to ratify it, and... They happily accepted it, every country joined, and there was never a war again. And every November 19th, we celebrate Woodrow Wilson Day, where the birth of a nation is played in every movie theater around the world, except that Congress actually said no. But there was nothing he could really do, because that previous October, he had suffered a stroke that basically left him confined to his office for the rest of his presidency. During this time, First Lady Edith Wilson was the only one who could easily access him frequently, leading many to believe, even to this day, that she made many presidential decisions for him, as his mental faculties were also pretty affected. For instance, Wilson had been strongly opposed to the women's right to vote, because of course he was. Suddenly, his wife said that he had a wonderful change of heart and he was happy for the 19th Amendment to pass. Hmm. Surprising everyone, in 1920, despite everything, Wilson announced that he would run for a third term as president. At the 1920 DNC, however, the party leader said, are you crazy? And forced him out, instead running Ohio Governor James Cox and Assistant Secretary of the Navy Franklin Roosevelt for vice president. So, though they kept many of Wilson's ideals. Republicans ran Ohio Senator Warren Harding, who pushed for what he called a return to normalcy. This message resonated with the public as Harding easily defeated James Cox. Wilson was unable to attend Harding's inauguration due to health problems, though he did meet with Harding on March 3rd, 1921, his last full day in office. The following day, the worst presidency anyone ever had came to a merciful end, and the country is now a flaming garbage bag compared to what it had been just eight years prior. So in 1921, former President Wilson and former First Lady Edith Wilson moved out of the White House and over northwest a bit into this house here. Due to his poor health not improving, he couldn't do much of anything anymore, though he did follow the actions of President Harding from the shadows. Despite his poor health, he actually managed to outlive President Harding and even attended his funeral. In a sort of ironic twist, 
the worst president we've ever had, live to see Calvin Coolidge, who I personally think is one of the best presidents we've ever had. On November 10th, 1923, he gave his final speech on Armistice Day on the radio. After that, his health declined more and more rapidly before he mercifully left the world without his presence on February 3rd, 1924. He didn't even come close to seeing what he had left the world with. So thus ends the story of the worst president we've ever had, the man who is somehow lenient enough to let the KKK return, and yet somehow intrusive enough to ruin Germany and the future of the next few decades. I'm not sure how to end this with something that I haven't already said, so I'm gonna let one of the best people on YouTube take it home. Suck it, Wilson. Take that. Take that.